Listen to the radio. Harry and Edna's wanna show you heard it from the three bells. What o and welcome to Harry and Edna on the wireless. And on this week's Harry and Edna on wireless, we thought we would feature the Battle of Britain. Joining us will be Peter from the Spitfire Society. We also have a reenactor, a chap, a wonderful chap named Bradley Cooper, who Edna met up with at the Imperial War Museum, Duxford, and he was portraying an, an a RAF Air Forceman. So we've got a bit of a chat in there. Indeed, Edna's segments are all recorded at the Imperial War Museum, Duxford. Now, Duxford is an amazing place. Not only is it a cracking museum, but it is actually the site of a World War II uh, operational airfield that saw service during the Battle of Britain. In fact, a bit of a sneaky tip-off. If you ever watched the 1960s film Battle of Britain, a lot of it was actually filmed there. So if you want to see what Duxford actually looks like, that's always a good tip-top tip. But first, I'll play a tune, and then we'll whiz over to Duxford, where Edna will be chatting to Bradley Cooper. What ho! I'm Bradley Cooper, and we're the historical display team. This weekend, we're portraying the Battle of Britain, so we've got a scenario set up with all the bell tents, and then the people as well. So we've got pilots, ground crew, WAFs, even a nurse on board with us today. So myself, at the moment, I'm dressed as a pilot, which will be on display later with the aircraft. So I'm wearing all the equipment that a pilot would have worn during the Battle of Britain, going up in a Spitfire or a Hurricane. We've got the nurse over there as well, in case anyone um, was on sick parade in the morning or later on, um, if anything would have happened, she would have been there to tend uh, to any of the injured pilots. We've also got a member of the WAF with us as well, who might have been working in operations, so she would have been possibly on the map board, so plotting where the aircraft were going to and from. And as well, we've got ground crew with us, so the ERCs, um, some of them are in overalls, so in case they were getting dirty, greasy, muddy, that kind of thing. So possibly they might have been in wellies or plimp soles. Um, so they would have been helping to rearm the aircraft, clean them uh, and fix them as well when they were coming backwards and forwards on operations. So if we can just talk through what you're wearing, you're in a shirt and tie. Would they have gone up flying in their shirts and ties? Yep, yeah, we're the Royal Air Force, so uh, we're always smartly presented. So, shirt and a tie, but where they were actually starched, if you ended up in the drink, the salt water sometimes would shrink the collar, so you'd end up strangling yourself, hence why you see sometimes they're wearing cravats and their collar shirts are open, because they soon realised what actually would happen. Oh, that's a really interesting point. I guess people don't associate... I, I associate a cravat just being a stylish thing with the pilots. No, it was quite a stylish thing for them to wear. They was always trying to show off between each other obviously we was known as the Brill Cream Boys um, for our hairstyles but no the cravat was not also a fashion accessory but also something which was quite practical because as well if the shirt and the tie was quite tight as well you need to be able to manoeuvre and see behind you in case the enemy is coming up um, to your rear you need to be able to turn around not only using the mirror which is in front of you but seeing exactly where they're coming from so you need to be able to have that flexibility. And could you just explain for our listeners as well, you've, you've got uh, somebody else next to you who I assume is also a pilot, and he's in a slightly different Serge-style uniform with a side cap, whereas you've got, is it an officer's cap? Yep, yeah, so I'm uh, dressed as an officer, so I've got a nice um, breather material, um, suit material, which was the army didn't particularly like us wearing this, and cost more money than their uniforms. Um, but next to me, I've got a... NCO, um, a pilot, so a flight sergeant, who would have been wearing the more itchy uniform because they wasn't an officer, because the demand was needed for the pilots that they started making the sergeants pilots as well after training them. So he's in a slightly more itchy uniform, but similar in style. The other ranks also um, wear the side cap, but they're made of a slightly different material and they have a different cap badge. So it's the cap badge, really, that differentiates the officers from the other ranks. She was issued with shoes, which everyone wore, especially from parade. But going at such an altitude as well, it gets very cold up there. So we've got roll neck jumpers on and silk gloves, leather gloves, chamois gloves. But also we've got the flying boots as well, which are fur lined. So obviously the cold is the last thing you want to do. You need to be able to be flexible. You don't want you joints getting stiff 
So we've got the nice fur-lined woolly boots to keep our feet nice and warm because it does get extremely cold up there. Do you have any particular stories that stand out in your mind that you've heard from some of the veterans? We have plenty of stories, especially quite recently. We've been speaking to a couple of stories, uh, a couple of veterans who have had uh, some very interesting stories, some of which I can't speak of, but we get all sorts of different stories out there. One that we're speaking to last week, he was talking about how he was in a deck chair just waiting around until that scramble bell went. And then the excitement, the adrenaline, they didn't need anything else to keep them going whilst they was up there, even though sometimes, especially for the bomber crews, they were often issued certain tablets to keep them going. But he said he never used them, he never needed it, because there was so much going on, and the fear and the worry of possibly never coming back. But he said he just lived every moment, every day, as it come. He never thought about the next day, because he never knew which day was going to be his last. Have you ever spoken to any of them about... Because Some of them were 19, you know, they were young, young men. Have any of them ever sort of felt they were kind of robbed of their youth as it were because they went I'm I'm sure they went from young men to grown-up men very quickly because of what they were going through have any of them sort of ever felt they missed out on on their youth I was speaking to a veteran fairly recently and he was saying that he came pretty much straight from education straight into the air force he was a young boy but as soon as he walked through them barrack doors that was it he became a man from that point onwards and he's never looked back since he feels that it was a great opportunity for him and for the rest of his family as well and something to be proud of and that he's never really looked back upon it as a bad thing he doesn't feel that he missed out if anything he feels that it was an opportunity that he grabbed with both hands and just did everything that he could at that point in time he enjoyed some of it but at the same time, he lost a lot of friends. Has any of them ever sort of described a feeling of a sense of it's just the job that had to be done? It's something that you were fighting for your country and, and that, that was the bottom line, really? We often thank them for what they did um, and try and give as much appreciation to them as we can. But I have always had the response of, at the end of the day we was doing our job and that's what I found with everyone whether they was Air Force or Army or even Navy to say that it was just their job and they felt it was their duty to fight for their country. When you talk to these guys have you do you ever get a sense of um, the joy of flying a Spitfire? Have any of them ever described to you what it's like to go up in a Spitfire for the first time and, and what it's like to engage the enemy? A lot of them talk about, well, sometimes they find it difficult at first, but soon we kind of take them back there and they feel like they're there actually then at that moment in time. And they talk about the thrill that they actually had being such a young boy and then having this machine around them and being in control of such a lovely aircraft something that not many people get the opportunity to do, even to this day, is quite a rare thing to actually go up in a Spitfire or a Hurricane and said there is nothing like it, feeling the power and then the adrenaline, spotting the enemy aircraft and then doing their job trying to defend our coast. Have you ever been up in a Spitfire or would you like to go up in a Spitfire? I've started up a Spitfire. Unfortunately, I've not been able to go up in one yet, but it is definitely something that I'll work towards in the future. Do you think if you were kind of born sort of 60, 70, 80 years ago, what, what would your choice have been to do in World War II? I think definitely it would have been the Air Force. One, they got the better uniforms, drink tea, sit in deck chairs all day, um, apart from obviously the job that they had to do. But I definitely think it's something that I would have done. I would have done it um, for King and Country, signed up with friends, colleagues and obviously family members as well to do my bit just as everyone else did back in the day. And if people want to find out more about the group and what you do, where can they find out some more details? There's lots of different groups about that do this sort of thing, reenacting, displaying what they did back in time, whether it be First World War or even Second World War. But if they go onto our website, which is www thdt.co.uk 
the historical display team. They'll see a list of events on there, they can come along, they can see what we got up to, or even become a part of us and help recreate history. What ho! This is Harry Nedner on the wireless, coming to you via internet radio, streaming, podcast and FM radio. In fact, we come to you all sorts, every media you can think of. We, we are trying to make Harry Nedner on the wireless available to you. If you want to find out different ways to listen to us, the best thing to do is to go to harrynedner.co.uk, click on the tab that says wireless. In a second, we're just going to whiz back over to young Edna, who is at us on a World War II Battle of Britain airfield, and she'll be chatting to Peter from the Spitfire Society. What ho! Hi, I'm Peter, and I'm with the Spitfire Society. The Spitfire Society was formed in the early 1980s by a group of wartime Spitfire pilots, principally a chap called um, Group Captain David Green, and uh, the the idea was really just to keep the the memory, the ethic of the Spitfire uh, alive um, into well into the uh, 20th century and beyond. Well, uh, of course, since that time, the legend of the Spitfire and the people who flew it and maintained it, built it, designed it, armed it, and so on, has just grown and grown. So the the legend of the Spitfire really doesn't need our help anymore but we've kept going um, in the same spirit that in which we were formed just to um, to uh, keep alive and to uh, respect the memory of the aircraft and all of the people involved with it uh, the future of the, the Spitfire in our in our culture and indeed in in world culture um, it had already become uh, iconic but at that time there were there was a lot of misinformation going around and it really needed something to bring the whole thing together to make it cohesive and uh, I think um, without wishing to speak on on behalf of the late uh, David Green I think that's more the idea was really to pull everything together and put it underneath one one umbrella initially as a as a younger man of course you're thinking it's all about the aircraft and that that wonderful plane um, but once you get to know the people involved with it that soon takes over and becomes far more important um, all of the people involved with the Spitfire uh, before the war during the war and indeed after the war really make up the whole history of the thing and um, put the put the meat on the bones if you like uh, the Spitfire itself is a fantastic plane but it's it's nothing without the without the people in my opinion when you've met some of these pilots people involved with it I, do you record all the stories is it do you then produce something that that is a collection of stories and memories and history I wish we did uh, I wish we'd um, we'd have, have had the uh, um, the resources and the uh, the, the, the people power basically to have done something like that um, what we have done is uh, ever since the inception of the Spitfire Society there has been a, a twice yearly magazine in which articles and stories are recorded and um, the society itself at that time was divided up into a number of regions and many of the regions would produce their own newsletter Sadly, over a period of time, the the regions have slipped away, and um, there are less and less of us able to be flying the flag. Uh, we are we represent the eastern wing or the Duxford wing of the Spitfire Society, and we still we still bring out a newsletter now and again with um, interviews and memoirs of people like um, Squadron Leader Ian Blair. Uh, who is one of our greatest supporters, comes along to all of our meetings. 95 years old, still drives, um, fantastic character. And it's people like him who give us the, uh, the energy to, um, to really record this stuff and, and get as much as we reasonably can down on paper. Uh, I think one of my favourite stories was one of Ian's. I don't know if he may have told you this already where uh, he was in a situation whereby he was forced to um, put his Spitfire down in a hurry in a um, in a ploughed field 
the result of this was that the Spitfire finished up upside down on its back in the ploughed field. He was okay, apart from a few a few nasty bumps, but he was he was all in one piece. Some locals came to help him out of the plane because they couldn't open the hood of the the plane, the cockpit, since it was resting on the ground. They decided to jack up the back of the aeroplane. Uh, using local stones from local dry brick walls. Uh, in the process of jacking the aircraft up, um, Ian was struggling in the cockpit to free himself and accidentally pressed the firing button on the uh, machine guns and cannon, um, which, if you've ever been up close to a Spitfire when the cannon are firing, it makes a very, very loud noise. The locals dropped the whole thing and... Uh, disappeared very quickly but um, of course as soon as they realised what it was they came back and, and helped him out but it's one of those stories that you'd have had to be there but um, certainly uh, my imagination paints a very vivid picture of that story for me. So how do people find out a little bit more about the society? Okay if you just put uh, Spitfire Society into uh, Google up will come um, the Eastern Wing has its own website, so if you put Spitfire Eastern into Google, uh, we'll be there, and there are interviews on the website in the archive uh, by a number of um, people associated with the Spitfire. Ian Blair was the face of a wartime poster, a very well-known uh, poster called Careless Talk May Cost His Life. Uh, it features a young pilot gazing wistfully into the distance in full flying kit and um, he was uh, asked to pose for the photograph used in the poster um, immediately after he was awarded his Distinguished Flying Medal. Um, he was awarded the DFM for helping nurse a stricken um, Bristol Blenheim back to base after the pilot had been mortally wounded. Ian himself was not a pilot at the time, um, so as a result of this astonishing piece of work, he was, he was awarded the DFM for saving his life, the life of the uh, air gunner, I believe, and for saving the aircraft. So do Google Ian Blair DFM for the, for the whole story. What ho! Now, if you'd like to listen to Harry and Edna and the Wireless again, you know you can. All the shows are online too, available to stream. Just go to harryandedna.co.uk and you can hear this and all the other previous shows. And one show you may be particularly interested in is, in fact, squadron leader Ian Blair, the Spitfire pilot Peter from the Spitfire Society was talking to. Well, in a previous show, he came and joined us on the show because he has some amazing tales and stories to tell of what it was like to fly Spitfires during the last war. Right. Well, it's time now for me to play another track. What ho! This is Harry and Edna on the wireless, and I'm just doing the nice links in between young Edna because she's whizzing around like a whizzy thing on the, at uh, at this airfield, and I gather she's going to do a little bit a little bit to tell us about one of the great flying aces that flew f from RAF Duxford straight after this track. What ho! February 1940, Flying Officer Douglas Bader was posted to No. 19 Squadron. Bader is the most famous of a number of fighter command aces who flew from Duxford. What ho! Overall, RAF Fighter Command was successful. The threat of invasion passed and Duxford's squadrons had played a vital role in the victory. What ho! Uh, 
And that tremendous roar of Merlin engines concludes our show about the Battle of Britain with 17 Spitfires all in the air at the same time.